All right, let's just make our final changes to the order completed events. Um, we're going to add this new event. We can go and commit that, and let's um, and yeah, let's let's ship it. There we go. It's shipped. Happy days. Event of an architecture. We can make changes. Life's easy. What is happening now? You think we can just ship changes and make things flipping work. So we've shipped out the update to the order completed event. Let's go and have a look now. Um, oh, that's interesting. Why did our request spike all of a sudden? It looks like some of these requests are from a downstream service calling back to our service and now requests have gone through the roof. Ah, uh, event driven architectures, here we go again. I thought they were easy. Hi, I'm James Easton, and in this video, you're going to learn about a smarter approach to making callbacks in your event driven systems. Now, if you're prioritizing thinner events, which you probably should be if you're communicating between service boundaries, then the consuming service might still need some additional information. But how do you manage that in a smarter way without overloading your own system as a producer? Because remember, the whole premise of event-driven systems is this idea of evolvability. Today, there might be one downstream consumer. Next week, there could be 10. Next year, there could be 100. You have no way to know what the downstream impacts could be. So how can you manage that better? And there are two tools you need here, caching and independent services. Now, the cache aside pattern is a mechanism by which you as a developer manually update the cache when things happen. An order gets updated, you write that to the cache. An order gets canceled, you also update that in the cache as well as your main data store. Every time you update data in your main data store, you also update that data in a cache. You're emulating the functionality of a write ahead cache. Whenever data changes, you cache it. Now this is useful for our purposes. It's useful because it allows you to protect the system that you're exposing to your users. Imagine you have your orders API here. This is the service that your users are interacting with. And maybe a user submits their order. At the point a user submits an order, you're going to write that order information to your primary database. And maybe you're also going to write that to another table inside the same database called Outbox. You're wrapping that in a transaction. You're implementing the Outbox pattern. You're updating your order state here. You're writing the event to be published to the Outbox. In this case, that would be an order submitted event. You've then got a separate process that's monitoring your Outbox, and it's going to publish that event onto your event bus. So now your order submitted event has hit the event bus. Now you might also have some downstream services who are interested in that order submitted event. Your downstream service is going to consume that order submitted event. This is a thin event, a notification event. Maybe that event only contains the order ID. This downstream service now needs more information about that order. The downstream service is going to make a callback to your order service, say, hey, give me all the order information for order one, two, three, four. And this is where the problem lies. The problem lies here because this downstream service may make lots and lots and lots and lots of requests back to your order service. Maybe you've got another two services that are also making calls back to this service. All of these calls coming back to your order service, all of these calls coming through and impacting your primary data store. Now, part of the problem here is the fact that you're going to overload this data store. And this is where caching gets really useful, particularly with this cache aside pattern. When that initial submit order request comes in, you're going to pull the order from the database. You're going to do the business logic needed to submit an order. You're going to write the state of the order back to the database. You're going to write your event to your outbox, and you're also going to update a cache. So you're going to now set the order information in the cache. So before this order submitted event gets published, the data has been written to the cache. What that means is that when these requests come back in, when these downstream services are making requests back to your order API, that request can be serviced from the cache. The response can go back from your API. You've only hit the cache. You haven't actually impacted your primary data store. 
That's only part of the problem, though. I actually think the bigger problem here is that your, all your requests are coming back into the same service that your users are also accessing. It would be really bad for your users if all of these internal services were to make requests, which caused the order service to fail, which meant a user couldn't go and order a pizza. A service that's user-facing has gone offline because of internal communication. So an alternative approach you can also use here, an alternative thing you can add, is to add another service. Remember, you've already got a worker service here that's processing your outbox. You've already got an API here for service servicing your public facing API. Why not add one additional service? And let's call that the internal API. This is the orders internal API. This is the API that should only be used by internal clients to make callbacks. This is not going to be exposed publicly. Because this is internal only, you can also start to use technologies like gRPC, for actually implementing that API. gRPC gives you an incredibly strong contract. You can share .proto files around and also generate SDKs in most programming languages, and it's an incredibly efficient data transfer format. So you can implement this internal API and share the endpoint of the internal API with all of these other services. What that means now is that when this order submitted event gets published, one of your consumers is going to consume it, and the consumer is instead now going to hit the internal API. From that internal API, you're going to read from the cache, retrieve the order information, and send that straight back to the consumer. Now you're doing all of this and only impacting those two components there, your cache and your internal API, which protects the user-facing service. It means that your user-facing service is only impacted by user traffic. You've got a separate service for managing your internal traffic, which stops these downstream callbacks impacting your upstream services. Now, this is a lot of boxes and lines, a lot of theory, a lot of architecture. Let's go up to our desk now and actually see how you might implement this. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about now is, of course, .NET specific, but these same patterns and ideas and practices can be applied whatever programming language it is that you're using. And we'll start with adding that caching layer. Now, in the .NET ecosystem, we're incredibly lucky because there's an interface that Microsoft provide that you can implement to easily add distributed caching to your applications. And inside the orders project, it's the orders service where we're going to implement some of this cache ahead type of stuff. Under the infrastructure project, you can see where some of this setup happens. So if you open up the setup, you will see that there is a call to add caching. This add caching function is just an internal service extension that will allow us to configure caching in slightly different ways. When you run the application locally, maybe you're going to use just a memory cache, maybe you're going to use Redis, Redis running in a Docker, Docker container. And then when actually running in production, this is going to use a service called Memento. Now, if you aren't familiar with Memento, they are a completely serverless cache. They also have some really cool topics and some storage stuff. But first and foremost, they started out as a cache. Fully serverless, pay as you go, a fantastic service, genuinely, if you want to go and implement caching. So if a Memento API key is configured, we're going to configure this I distributed cache to use Memento. That means inside the application code, we can just make a call to I distributed cache dot set string under the hood. That is then going to call out and use the Memento implementation. You'll notice that happens in the generic infrastructure project. The front end API, the internal service that we'll look at in a little while, and the background worker service all make a call out to this infrastructure project. That means whether it's a public facing API, whether it's the internal API, whether it's a background service, they all have access to that exact same cache using that exact same I distributed cache interface. And you'll also notice if you go and have a look at the order repository, this is where the actual implementation of the data access layer happens. Now this service uses MongoDB, that's largely irrelevant for the purposes of what we're talking about. And you'll see here when a record is updated or added to MongoDB, the record is written to the database, the outbox items are written. So for all of the events that need to be published, you're going to write that to an outbox. And then you're also going to set the string 
on the cash. Notice this underscore cash property is just using that I distributed cash. At runtime, that I distributed cash is going to be replaced with a memento implementation of a cash. And at the point an order is updated in the database, we're going to write a JSON representation of that order to the cash. Now I will point out quickly that all of this should be wrapped in a database transaction so it gets rolled back if it doesn't happen. Because of the version of MongoDB I'm using, both when running locally and running against MongoDB Atlas, it doesn't support transactions because I'm not using the clustered version of MongoDB. So this should be wrapped in a transaction. It isn't. If you're doing this in the real world, please wrap all of this inside a transaction. So what's going to happen now, whenever state is updated in the database, as well as the event being sent to the outbox, the cache is also going to be updated. What that means is that in our internal service, this is the internal implementation of the order service. This is going to be exposed only inside your network and it uses gRPC as its communication method. And the gRPC and the definition of the order service only allows get order details. This is a read only service to allow downstream systems to come and get information about a specific order. The actual implementation of that, if you have a look at the orders service, this is the implementation of the gRPC service. It uses the order repository and it also uses the distributed cache. So when a request comes in to get order information, the first thing that is going to do is check the cache. Now in an ideal world, and you would expect in a lot of cases, for there to be a cache hit. Remember, record updated in the database, record sent to the cache, event published, callback comes back into this service, the cache should still be populated at that moment in time. If the cache data is set, we're going to update the telemetry to mark this request as being a cache request. Now this is important because if there isn't a record in the cache, we're going to mark that as cached false. This will allow you to monitor the cache hits and misses in your observability backend. You can look at all of the requests that come into this service, how many are cached, how many are not. This will tell you if your cache is actually useful or if it's just adding unnecessary overhead. Now in an ideal world, the record is going to be cached which means we can then DC realize that cache data to an order object and then return a gRPC reply. Nice and simple. Now, of course, as a fallback, just in case the data isn't in the cache, we're going to make a call to the actual MongoDB database. We're actually going to query the database. We don't want this to fail completely. We expect in most cases for the data to be Cache. So all of these services are going to be running together inside the Jure. The cache gets updated. The event gets published. The kitchen service reaches back in, gets the information from the cache. Shall we see if all of this works? Let's find out. So now that we've got this all up and running and deployed, we've got our cache aside pattern implemented. Let's actually see this in action. So I'm going to come over to Postman now. Um, and there's a Postman collection in the root of the GitHub repo if you want to just go through and run this on your own. And I'm going to go and create a brand new order. And I'm just going to grab that order identifier that gets returned. The order identifier is held as a variable just so we can interact with that same order over and over again. And if I come get the order details, I can see I've got some order details. The order has only been created. So if we work through how you would actually create an order, I'm going to add a new item to that order. I'm going to add a margarita pizza in this case. Um, and then I'm going to go off and I'm actually going to submit the order. Now in the background, what is going to happen at this point is that the payment is going to be taken by the payment service. That's going to come back to the order service. The order service is going to publish that order confirmed event, which is where we then expect the kitchen service to make a callback to retrieve that information from the cache, we hope. So let's go and actually see that happening now. All of these services are instrumented with open telemetry. So I'm using Datadog by way of just having an observability backend. This could of course be any observability backend. It could be Jaeger if you're running this locally. And if I just refresh these, um, these stream of events, I'm looking at only the traces for the internal service. This is only the service that is hitting the callbacks. And if I can see there's a request at 1103, which is about now, to actually get the order details. I can actually see that the request went out to the cache, which is good. And if I go and have a look at my span tags, I can see somewhere in here, there is going to be a tag for cached equals true, which means that thankfully this request was received from the cached. And if we zoom out a little bit here, we can actually see the full end-to-end -end flow of what happened. You can see initially the order.orderconfirmed event was published. This service uses an anti-corruption layer. So the public order confirmed event was processed. That was republished as an internal event that's internal to the kitchen service. 
That internal event was then processed, processed internal.kitchen.orderconfirmed.v1. So that's an internal instance of that order confirmed event was then processed. The request then went back to the order detail service, which we can see was retrieved from the cache. We can see that both with the actual trace information via the request that went out to the cache, but we can also then see that the cached property was set to true, which is really helpful. We could also take that cached property and actually filter by cached equals true. So let's look at all the requests now inside our system that were cached, which is great. There's been two requests since I've started running these services that were retrieved from the cache, but we can equally have a look at cached false. And thankfully there's been nothing in the last 15 minutes where cached was set to false. Let's have a look at the last hour. So we do have a request that came back in previously where it was not cached. So here you can see the request came in. For some reason, the request to the cache failed. So it then went back out and made a call to the MongoDB database. So you can see the benefit there, regardless if it is hitting the cache or not hitting the cache, you're protecting your user facing service. You're protecting your public service. And if you can use a cache as well, you're also protecting your database. Sounds good to me. Now, thin events are great when it comes to sharing data between domains or service boundaries. And Postel's law, otherwise known as the robustness principle, states that you should be conservative in what you do and be liberal in what you accept from others. And you're doing that by prioritizing thinner events, only sharing the maximum data that is necessary. But you're also considering the fact that your system doesn't exist in a vacuum downstream systems may well need to get more information from yours. So you're starting to think ahead and using a serverless caching service like Memento gives you low cost and low overhead caching to protect your service when those callbacks inevitably come. So think about caching, think about callbacks, and I'll see you all next time.